All right, Marty Bent, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Graham, I'm pumped to be here. Big day. It's a uh, big, big day. I'm happy that we're having a conversation. Need a, need a bit of a distraction with okay. all the chaos going on here in the United okay, States. Cool. Well, so for the record, we are recording on election day, uh, presidential election in the US. So uh, I understand that uh, you might be uh, a bit excited. I um, I am I am following it, of course, from a distance. But uh, yeah, excited to see where it goes. I hope uh, you know eventually Bitcoin doesn't care. But uh, I think we have a preference. Definitely. Yeah, exciting. Uh, exciting may not be the word. I think it's a bit tense, and uh, mm. it seems like we can go down one of two drastically different paths. I think. Yeah, people are waiting with bated breath to see see how this ends up. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to uh, actually. I was just on on Twitter, like trying to find like um, like polling re polling results or anything. I don't know if you seen anything, but it it seems quite hard to be honest. There. Are... This is one of the reasons I love Twitter and people uh, have been underutilizing it for years, for over a decade, mm. in my opinion, list. So I, I actually do have a list called polls. Oh, really? That I've been uh, following on Twitter for like the last month that has been very high signal. Just a group of pollsters from different sides of the aisle and different parts of the country. And that data has been pretty rich. There's only a few states with any meaningful... Um, voting data that have rolled in. I mean, we're recording this at uh, around 2 p.m. Central. Yeah. Um, so things will start to heat up. But when we're done recording, go find that list and follow it. That's where okay, all the signal is. Awesome. Share it with me. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to begin, you know, of course, like uh, for me, you are uh, um, an OG to a degree, especially someone that I followed for a long time, you making your podcast. And I was thinking maybe it's a fun idea to start with the question, why is Bitcoin such a big idea that also you decided to spend, you know, your precious time on? Uh, why is Bitcoin such a big idea? I mean, for me personally, um, I was fine-tuned to be receptive to Bitcoin when I found it in 2013, I believe. And that was because I was a child of the great financial crisis. And I think the juxtaposition of the great financial crisis and the launch of Bitcoin alongside that really highlights how big of an idea it is. And so at the time, when I found Bitcoin, I was working at a managed futures fund and um, I was, we, we indexed commodity trading advisors and they traded currencies, commodities, fixed income, equities indices. And part of my job as an analyst was to uh, not only look at how the funds that we index traded, but then look at broader markets and how they were trading external to the funds that were, were trading the individual markets. And one of the core markets that I followed was currency markets, FX markets. And at that time, Janet Yellen was the chairwoman of the Federal Reserve. We were transitioning from Operation Twist to QE2. And as a 21, 22-year-old analyst, really getting my bearings on how all this worked and being inundated with um, following markets and, and having to do that as a job, uh, you, you realize how much the monetary systems globally are, are micromanaged and the way in which they're managed just f felt really off to me. And I've said this story before, but there was one particular you know, press conference that Janet Yellen um, held where she was wearing a purple pantsuit and uh, made some comments about the stability of markets and the fact they were doing QE2 to bring more stability and um, went on after the press conference, went onto the internet and looked at what other analysts were saying. And most of them were saying she was wearing a purple pantsuit. That's regal. She's exuding strength to the market. So that means she must be confident in the U.S. economy. And therefore, um, we should place our bets on U.S. dollar uh, accordingly. And that just seemed insane to me. And so when it comes to a big idea and Bitcoin being a big idea, juxtaposed to that system, it's a massive idea because it completely removes that arbitrary 
yeah. individual or coalition of individuals, uh, individual central banks and every central bank combined and encodes the, the monetary policy. And so you don't have to make bets based off of the particular garb one of these central bankers is wearing on any given day. And the fact that one individual could have a profound influence on the most important price in global markets, which is the price of interest rates and um, the dollar's relative strength to, to other currencies is objectively insane. And so Bitcoin as a big idea, I mean, I think I got it immediately when I found it while I was doing that side, doing that work on the fiat side, following all these central bank tea leaves, and then realizing what Bitcoin brought to the world in terms of a network with a monetary policy that wasn't dependent on what any individual was wearing on any given day of any given year. Um, you, you knew what the policy was. You, you can, you can predict what it's going to be. It's encoded. You don't even predict. You know what it's going to be yeah. at any particular block height. And that is a massive idea when you juxtapose it with the way the fiat system works. Yeah, I think in essence what you're talking about is this uh, rulers versus rules, right? Uh, and I think you can only see it when there is something that you can compare it to, right? So when you came across Bitcoin and and, and there's this juxtaposition with you know, seeing this, um, this, um, this, this media moment of her, right? I, I think this is the core, you know, like, should you follow other people or should you follow a public set of rules that anyone can verify? You know, that is probably the core between this new Bitcoin system and this old system where, yeah, there's a bunch of random people that don't care about, you know, your individual life as much as you care, um, about it. And, Basically, they set the price of the reward that you spend your finite time and energy um, on. You know, we see that, of course, now because we also see this other paradigm. How do you think we can simplify that for people that look at Bitcoin from, you know, the old paradigm, as Jeff Booth talks about a lot? I think a lot of pitches about Bitcoin sound too good to be true. And it is because, you know, the current paradigm is so messed up that you you could not even see a possible solution, you know, even if it was put in front of your nose. Um, but we need, of course, more people to adopt Bitcoin eventually. So how how do you think we could simplify that? Well, in the context of rules versus rulers, like what the story that I just described, um, basically explain forward looking actions that the market took based off of a press conference, and that that is insane in and of itself. However, we do also have basically data points in terms of uh, proclamations that central bankers made at particular points of time in the past mm. about how markets would react to their policy decisions and what actually happened. And Parker Lewis wrote a research paper about this, I believe in 2017, called Ender's Game, where he basically went back and read through all the Federal Reserve minutes of their board meetings going all the way back to 2005 and the way the um the the minutes of those meetings works is they release them publicly i believe four to six years after they actually happen and so um in 2016 when he began writing this paper you were able to see exactly what the central bankers were saying internally amongst each other about the policy decisions they were thinking about making and how they thought it would affect uh, markets overall. And in that paper, he essentially highlights that they had no idea what they were doing. They would make these proclamations, they would make the policy change, and then lo and behold, uh, the market would react in a way that was completely inverse to what they expected um, time and time again throughout, um, throughout that seven-year period, the two years before the great financial crisis in 2005, all the way up into QE2 in Operation Twist. And so simplifying that and giving people the confidence to jump into Bitcoin, uh, uh, comparing it to this system, it's like we have the data, we have the proof. These people have no idea what they're doing. They don't understand 
the implications of their policy decisions over the long term. How could they? You cannot micromanage and centrally plan a global economy. It is mm. it, it is an impossible task and a very hubristic stance to believe that you can go out and complete that task. Whereas Bitcoin, that's the thing. Like you, you have like Satoshi on January third, two thousand nine, said, "These are the rules. Here's the supply schedule of when we're going to release Bitcoin. Here are the blocks at which we're going to." reduce the rate of um, new Bitcoin being entered into the market. And here is the, um, the, the cadence at which we're going to adjust the difficulty to add a block of transactions to, to the ledger. And that's the only proclamation that Bitcoin has ever made. Mm-hmm. And it has been consistent over the course of almost 16 years now at this point. Like you can go back... Satoshi, by writing the code and hitting launch on January 3rd, said, this is what's going to happen in Bitcoin. And it's the only time he ever said it. And exactly what he said was going to happen on that date has played out over the last 16 years. Yeah. And so if you're looking for confidence and the ability to plan uh, economic coordination around a monetary good with some certainty of a rule set, um, yeah. Bitcoin is far superior to the incumbent central banking system. It's purely based off of objective fact, off of what Bitcoin said it was going to do in January 3rd, 2009, and then comparing that to what all these central bankers um, said they were going to do and how it was going to affect markets and what actually played out. Are you looking to save in Bitcoin for your retirement? Meet OnRamp, the leader in Bitcoin financial services. OnRap has just launched the industry's first Bitcoin IRA with multi-institution custody. That means unparalleled support, transparency, and peace of mind for your retirement. With OnRamp, you can verify your assets directly on-chain and protect them with the support of three independent institutions, eliminating the risks of a single point of failure. Are you ready to take control of your Bitcoin retirement? Visit the link below or go to onrampbitcoin.com to learn more about OnRamp's Bitcoin IRA. Well, maybe that's the paradigm shift, right? Like uh, something is doing the thing that it's promised, that it promised, right? Like that is so out of this world, basically, that uh, it, it's so hard for people to understand. But I always also try to go that way where I just say like, you know, the entire promise of Bitcoin is that it stays the same and you don't have to trust anyone for that, right? You can verify that for yourself. Like that's the entire point. So in that sense, it's also... Not I say not risky, but way way less risky than you know adopting any other money. Where, well, you basically have to be a financial analyst to figure out uh, how how the next quarter your money is going to be um, priced, basically, and uh, how hard you have to work or take more risk to to mitigate the increased risk that is brought into your life. You know, um, yeah, I think that's the core of the paradigm shift at. I also wanted to ask you, I, I heard you say before somewhere that it requires courage to adopt Bitcoin. Why Why do you think that is? I mean, it's a big step. It's a foreign, I mean, to us, maybe not at this point, but to most people on the planet, it's this foreign technology that, um, and not only foreign technology, but a, a foreign way of interacting with money. I mean, many people use the analogy of our connection with fiat currencies being similar to that of fish swimming in water. You ask the fish, do you see the water? And they say, what's water? And they, they've been swimming it in their whole, throughout their whole lives, and they don't even understand it exists. They just take it for granted and think that's the way the yeah. world works, which for fish it is. Like They need water to live, but um, in the context of human connection with fiat currencies, particularly for millennials, for people our age and even older and younger, they just think that's the way money works. And so it takes courage to recognize and reconcile with yourself that you had a fundamental misunderstanding of what money is and what a good money looks like. You took that for granted. You essentially abdicated responsibility for understanding this to the government and um, the, the people who taught you about money and finance throughout your life and never 
um, never took the time to understand money as a concept and a tool from first principles. And so it does take courage in the fact that you have to develop the um, necessary humility to admit to yourself that you've been lied to, you've been duped. And many people don't want to do that. And then on top of that, um, yeah. it is a foreign technology in the sense that you have to interact with it differently than the monetary technologies that you grew up with. Uh, private public key management is not something that you have to deal with in the incumbent banking system um, too often, unless you have something like a safety deposit box. It's probably um, the only correct analog to um, securing money in the, the fiat world with you know, Bitcoin. And so I think it takes courage on two fronts predominantly, but to have the humility to admit that you've been duped um, and, and didn't take the time to understand money. And then also from an operational perspective, learn how to interact with this new monetary tool um, and, and learn how to secure it properly yeah. because it is vastly different than everything you grew up with. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I always have the example of, you know, when you were younger or, well, you, you have kids, right? At one point, you're going to talk about money and you give them some bills and some coins and you send them to a store and they give the bill and they get a, a, a lollipop or a cookie in return. And basically, that's how they learn about money, right? Like, oh, apparently this is um, this is the thing that we use or how you interact in a store or, or something like that. Yeah, I, I find it, uh, I, lo I love your answer because I think, this is really part of the of the of the bitcoin journey that is uh, you know not not about iq it's more about this humility or or more like you know being able to challenge your your ego and being honest with yourself and as you said like you've really been duped like no one told you about this even in your economics class in high school you were calculating stuff but but what you know like it's, it's fascinating it is and it's not in I think that's one of Bitcoin's biggest hurdle is uh, having new waves of people and larger waves of people develop the humility to recognize that they've been duped. Um, however, I do think the central bankers and governments are working hard to force people to develop yeah. that humility because um, yeah. <laughs> they're, you know, they're never going to stop debasing the fiat currencies. They're never going to stop issuing debt unless they're forced to by the market adopting Bitcoin um, and the, the ramifications of that are debasement, loss of purchasing power, inability to coordinate throughout the economy. So when push comes to shove and the friction created by this consistent debasement gets to a point where people are like, wait, this is obviously not working anymore. The water is poisoned and I need to mm -hmm. figure out a new pool to jump in. That's when yeah. I'll quickly develop the humility. Mean, at that point, it might not even be Humility, maybe pure survival tactics of, okay, this money's broken. Obviously, I need to find new money. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so fascinating that um, we basically have, some, you know, the truth on our side in a sense that, you know, we have this ledger, which is the engineered truth of, of Bitcoin. And we can always refer back to that, like, okay, it's still the same and you can verify it for yourself, etc. And I think the fact that we have that as our ammunition and basically I think the call to action for us is to practice what we preach, right? The low time preference, just keep talking about this, not stop talking about this, right? And just waiting for this flawed system to to basically, well, I don't even think we have to get to the implosion of it. But as you said, you know, there's going to be an inflection point where people are like, okay, what is what is really going on? Perhaps it's all the way up to, you know, adopting a CBDC and getting 50 free <laughs> digital dollars or digital euros. And then, you know, your car stops somewhere in the middle <laughs> of the road or I don't know. I, I think for a lot of people, we have to get to that point, right? Where, where the pin terminal says, no, you cannot buy this meat or something like that. But, um, I kind of see like Bitcoin as this mirror, right? It's just a parallel money system. And the more people move and the more people see that the people that moved, you know, are happier and more optimistic about the future. I think there's a big social signal um, eventually as well, not necessarily just, you know, factual as in, you know, your money uh, has lost another 90% or whatever, but um, 
yeah, just seeing, uh, I think basically that people are more optimistic about the future and just a general outlook on life or how they operate versus like the nihilistic, uh, outlook that, uh, I think also a lot of people in our generation have. Yeah. And I think that's a very important point and something I've certainly been guilty of in the past is dooming like doom and gloom like you need bitcoin because the world's going to shit if you don't get it you're going to get left behind which to a degree i mean i believe but i think from a perspective of trying to convert people to come to your side the government's certainly good at using fear anger and anxiety to get what they want over time but uh sometimes it's begrudgingly i think a much better framing for bitcoin is positive it's like hey you you have agency over your monetary life. Um, you have the ability to participate in this distributed network, whether that's simply by accumulating Bitcoin and holding it or contributing to the open source software project that enables it to, to run. And um, there are bad things going on in the incumbent financial system. The debt situation is pretty terrible. The debasement of the currency is pretty consistent and likely to um, continue. However, we do have this tool, this safety net, this release valve, this rocket ship, whatever you want to refer to it as, that, that can lessen the blow of the inevitable deterioration of this fiat system that you came up in. And I think framing it that way, where you have a way out, and mm-hmm. not only do you have a way out, you can build a much better world via um, an economy built on bitcoin and with that in mind like the deterioration of the fiat system is inevitable it's happening it has been happening it was happening before bitcoin bitcoin is a direct response to the deterioration of that system and the inability to trust the people controlling that system um and so you should be thankful that this thing exists because without it uh the prospects of a better future would be significantly lower than they are right now yeah but to be honest, I think the the doom and gloom part I've definitely been in as well. But it's kind of well for me. It was necessary to kind of get this confirmation of okay, this is you know uh, like like Greg Fall says, like it's just math. You know, it's mathematically assured that the dollar will debase and that there will be a point. I mean, I, I think there's a treasury auction today, right? That uh, that countries. Uh, don't want to buy the u.s debt anymore almost hitting 35 trillion uh, today right like 36 36 and yeah one more so, trillion this has an end you know this risk-free stuff this country's buying uh u.s debt stuff like it's coming to an end and i think there is a good thing in realizing that that's not necessarily an opinion right like you can listen to people talking about that right but it's good to have your own understanding about this that, you know, in order to pay for the debt or at least try or pretend to, right? They're going to need to print money and more units debase all the existing units. And that is just, you know, a never ending thing. And I think in general that you, you, that, that is part of the reason of existence of Bitcoin that I think people do need to understand before they can even see the solution, right? Like it's better to pitch the problem than, than, um, just just pitch the solution like there has to be a reason why this thing has a has a right to exist yeah and luckily for us the ability to highlight the problem is getting easier i mean let's just focus in on the u.s national debt approaching 36 trillion as you mentioned there's a 10-year treasury auction today of 42 billion uh there's a 30-year treasury um issuance tomorrow i believe 25 billion so that's 67 trillion in debt i believe there's 47 trillion or excuse me billion 67 billion 47 billion of uh, previously issued debt that's rolling over coming to term and so that's a net um, positive of around like uh, 20 billion 25 billion dollars being added to the national debt we're 30 billion below um 36 trillion right now so we'll surpass 36 trillion dollars in debt um in probably within the coming weeks and this is fresh in my mind because i read a newsletter about this last night but back to my point if it's getting easier 
to highlight the problem to people like people react viscerally to to imagery and the charts tell the story pretty starkly and in the newsletter i referenced or i wrote last night i referenced just the growth of the national debt going back to 1983 when the national debt was 1.2 trillion uh you go up to the the 2008 crisis right at the crisis it was 12 trillion so it took um 50 or 25 26 years beginning of 29 20 000, excuse me 2009 it was uh 12 trillion so it took 26 years to 10x from there and since 2009 uh we've 3x from there um so 26 years to 10x uh another 15 to 3x from there so with 30x from the base and if you just look at the chart and you look at all yeah. these different slope changes in the rate of change of the national debt in the US like it's reaching exponential curve territory and uh, humans don't understand exponentials when they're living through them however if you can zoom out and look at a chart it's pretty impossible to ignore and i think anybody that looks at this chart has doing the intuition understanding this at the national debt is that this seems like a pretty big problem and it seems to be getting worse at a faster and faster rate and so in that regard i think as it stands today late 2024 it's easier than it ever has been to highlight the problem to people it's like look at this chart and tell me on the chart where you see the trend reversing and if it doesn't reverse where is it going to go and if Mm -hmm. it goes to where it looks like it's going to go what does that mean for the money that you're using or the government that is issuing this debt and i think anybody with two eyes you can actually see and a sensible intuition could say this is not good. Yeah, I agree. I, I always say the same thing about like what is the trend you see if it's up then you know there's there's no real denying. And what I what I like about it, and I think it's almost poetic, right? Like these people like Yellen or you know uh, people before her or the, the person before um uh Powell, you know it's all talk, right? It's all talk. It's all window dressing. Um, it's all using fancy words. You know, I think there was, there was also someone on Twitter who looked up like these uh, statements that, that they give and just like how they just change a few words every time. Right. So, um, you know, changing resilience to another word, but it's basically the same, right. Or like a little number somewhere and like, it's all talk. And what I, what I love so much about Bitcoin is that it's, it's the talk and the walk, right? Like we can talk about Bitcoin and if someone says, but, you know, can you back that up? And then it's like, here, yeah, sure. You know, like you can, you can verify this, this entire thing. And I think that has given me the confidence that over a long enough time frame, right? And that is the personal challenge that you, that you lower your, your own, own time preference and, and stick with this, you know, is that, you, you see that they will they will cross basically like one is going down one is going up and yeah it's just it, it, you know walk and talk is uh is better than just the talk so I, I i always like use that analogy because there's nothing that you can really verify about anything about the dollar basically no and bitcoin takes another step forward roughly every 10 minutes so you can literally point and you don't have to wait yeah it's walking too yeah. you don't you don't have to wait two months between Mm. FOMC meetings and the press conferences they they give to try to understand where Bitcoin is between that. It's like, no, you just hit get uh, TX info verify or get TX verify info. Uh, and yeah, it's right there on your node. Yeah. You can verify it at any given point in time. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like we have the data and the information. Like they've proclaimed things many times across many years um thinking that certain actions or certain um certain uh um certain not actions but certain things would materialize based off of their policy movements never materialized in fact um the economy suffered worse because of those actions that they thought were going to make the economy and the financial system better um compounding risk and hiding risk uh, in areas that bubble up and create these liquidity crises from time to time. And they're happening more frequently um, as, as they manipulate the Frankenstein more and more year in and year out. And 
yeah, that's like that's what I think people, particularly those who may be listening and are not, uh, I don't want to say economically literate, but aren't paying attention to what these central bankers are doing and have that question in your mind, like, why should I trust these Bitcoin guys um, versus these central bankers who are in these positions of prestige um, and they're in front of my TV and they've got good suits on and um, they've been appointed by very important uh, politicians. Like, why should I trust these crazy people? On, on YouTube versus <laughs> these very well polished um, and well spoken bureaucrats. And again, I would highly recommend just going and reading what they've said in the past versus what's happened. And it, it'll be pretty clear. It's all, like you said, it's all a projection game. Like that, the, the word changes and the FOMC meetings are hilarious. I mean, there's a term for it here in the US. Like as soon as those meeting notes drop, um, it's it's called the red line. It's like all right, zero hedge. It's like where's the red line? Here are the red lines for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's literally how markets trade. It's like all right, what did they red line? What did they change? And how are you positioning our portfolio based off of the minute changes to the the positioning of the central bank? Yeah, I think this is a whole different conversation. But the the fact that that what you said is real, that is so insane, right? So. You are a professional trader and you are just sitting in front of the TV to wait what, you know, a randomly appointed person tells you. And based on that, you know, you're, you're going to do your job. Like it's just, there's I mean, no value. It's like a, it, it, it's, a, it's kind of like a degenerate game, you know, that and like that, I mean, that action alone, you have thousands, tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of analysts globally that that is their job. Yeah. It's going to happen this Thursday. The FOMC meets tomorrow here in the United States, and it's going to be a big meeting. They're, they cut rates by 50 bips in September, and the long end of the yield curve went higher again. They thought they tamed inflation, and they're going to bring um, the federal funds rate down, and therefore they'll, they'll solve the long end of the yield curve. Those yields will come down because the economy... We'll understand that the, the Fed thinks that the economy um, is in a position uh, it's it to it, it it has solved inflation and the end of the yield curve is saying like no um, mm -hmm. the smart traders are saying no I don't think that yields have gone up so just another stark example of literally within the last two months the Fed proclaiming that it understood what was going on in the economy making a rate decision and then markets. Uh, acting conversely to what they they thought would happen, and yeah. inversely to what they thought would happen. Um, but again, that like think of the opportunity cost of productivity. Um, going back to your your paper, like the, the the opportunity cost of productivity of wasting it's wild millions of hours yes. of of work um, every two months just waiting for this. Um, the minutes from this meeting to be released or the, the press conference notes to be released and people are literally, all right, where's the red line? What words have changed? Okay, now I can go do my job. Um, <laughs> that is insane. Like, there's Marty, this way better things is, we could be doing. This construct is actually really good because it gives a lot of people a lot of jo jobs. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other... <laughs> That's, I mean, I mean, like, they could say that. I mean, it's more like a joke, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if they would say that. Right? Like, we give no, a lot of people a lot of jobs. You know? They definitely would. And yeah. I would say we would have Dyson spheres by now if uh, we didn't we didn't accrue yeah, all that I, opportunity I, cost of spending our mental yeah. bandwidth on on red lines and in Fed minutes. Yeah. Well, so what you said, you know, about the yields on the treasuries, right? Like that's basically the interest that um, that the the buyers of the debt. Uh, get they are going up again which means they're it's not attractive enough right and um yeah i think it's just these little things that at least i picked up along the way where i'm like okay this is it's just it, it just makes sense that less and less people would want to buy the debt that of course they say they have it under control you know, in Europe, we have uh, Christine Lagarde talking about the taming the beast of inflation, you know, and when I heard that, I was like, but no, th this is the result of a, of a human made system, you know, like, what are you talking about? You know, and, and 
there you really see the gaslighting. You know, it it would be less bad if people would just say, you know, we adopted a fundamentally flawed system, but they will never say that, right? So once you pick up on these little signals of gaslighting where you can really see that it's just nonsense that they're talking about or just, you know, I mean, as a European, sometimes I see these press conferences or this woman um, uh, for the White House, I keep forgetting her name. Sometimes I think like, is it a test? Like what they say, is it a test to see how many people are actually uh, listening to what they are saying, right? Like sometimes there's such ridiculous statements. Uh, and at these moments, I'm just like, is this, yeah, is this a test? You know, are they trying to see how far they can yeah. take the gaslighting? Basically, It's a humiliation ritual. I think Christine Lagarde said, I think she said we tamed inflation a little bit. We're going to have like a, a small reprieve uh, a short reprieve from the inflation when it's going to go back up or in due time the other, yeah <laughs> in due time it will come or <laughs> so yeah. something yeah but but even when they say like oh inflation is down yeah this month you know you know count and, up <laughs> well, yeah, just... and that's the other thing too the uh in terms of the humiliation ritual it's again orwellian doublespeak and propaganda particularly from central bankers when they say inflation is down what they're really saying is the rate of inflation is down. And so yeah. like prices are going, still going up just a little bit slower than they were exactly. the month before. And yeah. um, even low inflation, quote unquote, low inflation, a low inflation rate. Um, obviously people want prices to go up slower. So it is a good thing, but it's building on a higher base. So like every two, like even if you get it down to 2%, uh, the two percent is growing on a base that is significantly larger than it was five years ago. So that yeah. that is in nominal terms, real terms, like way more real terms. It's way more impactful than two percent inflation in 2019, 2018. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So if we get more people to be aware of this problem, this uh, mathematical assurance of, uh, of 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 the debasement, basically. And, and more people get into Bitcoin and the adoption grows. How do you kind of like see this balance shifting between now people really are focused on, I'd say, the store value aspect of, of Bitcoin? Of course, a lot of critics say, you know, you can still, you still can't pay with it. You know, it's not a medium of exchange, et cetera. Um, I personally think, you know, store value comes before medium of exchange. If I am not able to save in something, why would I want it as a reward? Um, you know Jesse Myers. I think he has the a two hundred trillion dollar use case of uh, uh, store value. You know, so we have have a have a hell of a way to go. Yeah, what's what's your view on that? Is that I think I th I think we should, of course, not lose uh, focus on the eventual you know medium of exchange part, but just getting to a big enough global. Uh, store value asset that that still has a long way to go yeah i think i think the whole misnomer that bitcoin isn't a medium of exchange now is just completely overblown it is i mean predominantly objectively people recognize the asymmetry of the potential that exists right now bitcoin's at a 1.4 trillion dollar market cap and many of us believe it could hit 200 300 trillion dollars and so yeah like it would make sense to hold on to as much bitcoin as you can between now and then however it does not uh, prevent anybody from using bitcoin as a medium of exchange people do every day i do and it's right now it's happening at the edge cases where at tftc we have uh contractors that help us out with post-production and they live in countries that um with, with bad banking systems and even if they do have good banking systems the the fee to um send money across the border is pretty pretty egregious and so i pay some of our contractors in bitcoin because it is a faster and objectively cheaper way to get money to them um for for providing my company uh, a service and the point i'm making here is like bitcoin already is 
a medium of exchange. It's just somewhat of an edge use case um, due to the fact that mm. most people holding Bitcoin are looking at that asymmetric upside and saying, I'm going to hold. Um, but it doesn't preclude you from, from spending it. Many people do. We're seeing this on Noster. Um, people zapping all over the place. Um, we see it in podcasting 2.0. People literally listen to our shows and they're streaming us Bitcoin per minute listen. Um, and I think the payment activity is only increasing and only has increased over time. Um, and so, yeah, I think Bitcoin already is a medium exchange. It's a unit account already for, for many people, but predominantly as it stands today where we are on the path towards um, uh, achieving the goals of a multi-hundred trillion dollar market cap, most people are using it as a savings vehicle. That's perfectly fine. And I think slowly but surely over time, these edge cases will um, come closer to the core of, of Bitcoin's, or excuse me, of individuals' usage of Bitcoin. Um, and it's just going to take time. And it obviously, when the liquidity within the Bitcoin market is hundreds of trillions of dollars, people are going to um, be more willing to part ways with Bitcoin to pay for goods and services um, because they're not worried about the upwards potential from those levels is significantly um, lower than it is from yeah. these levels. Um, and then uh, the other factor in this is how quickly is the incumbent fiat system devolving? Like if you have a quick rapid debasement of these fiat currencies and people literally cannot coordinate economic activity to provide goods and services to the market, they'll want to adopt uh, a better money on their balance sheet and um, use that as a treasury asset that ultimately is used to reinvest in their business so that they can coordinate economic activity to deliver goods and services um, efficiently and w with more certainty. Um, yeah. So that was a long-winded way of saying, like, it is a medium exchange now for some people. It's a bit of an edge case, but I think that edge case is coming closer to the core. And I do think, um, I do think Bitcoin is going to succeed and reach those levels much faster than most people, even in the industry, believe. Again, going back to, if you look at the chart of the national debt and monetary base growth globally, like it's the, the, the growth slope is getting higher and higher and uh, going back to the point that people don't understand exponentials when they're living through them. Um, I think we are living through an exponential period of debt growth that people really haven't internalized most people yet. Um, yeah. And I think we're, we're getting to exponential territory and, once you get to that territory, things happen pretty quickly. Yeah, I I, I would agree. By the way, so I don't uh, um, I, I I don't follow you know the the, the critics argument here. I just think, um, as you said, you know it's um, it's a way of, of of thinking about time in general, right? Like it's it's also a bit this this short term thinking that you know okay, this was the proposition. Why isn't it that right now? You know. And then I always say, well, you know how many ideas are being released on the internet every day? And this thing that was released 15 years ago um, has survived. You know, it's the strongest computer network in the world, like all, all these things. Um, and so I think in general, just understanding Bitcoin is a test of humility. Holding it is a test of humility. <laughs> you know, it's um, really realizing that you you just don't know everything and that it's okay because you have a certain foundation that you know guides you on a certain path towards the the future and i think adopting bitcoin lowers your uncertainty towards the future so that gives you yeah the motivation or the strength to actually be positive and and just keep on continuing um what you're doing and i agree like at th there has to be an inflection point again where people will start to realize or think about, you know, what is a better money enemy? And we're totally in it, right? People substitute money and save in houses and stuff like that. But I mean, like just for the daily exchanges or weekly exchanges between people, um, yeah, there has to be uh, an inflection point. Yeah, and it's, 
it, 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 the meme of merchant adoption was big. And like when I first got into Bitcoin, like 2013, 2014, part of the reason why Bitcoin cash exists and Roger Ver rage quit was because this idea of merchant adoption didn't materialize. Um, and be cash people didn't think that, um, uh, people were, were scaling on chain Bitcoin the right way. Um, and they were victims of bad timing. This is something at 1031 that we think about quite, um, quite a lot and is core to a lot of the decisions we make when allocating money to, to companies in the space is, is this product, um, uh, has it come at the right time? Is it the right time yeah. for this product? And still to date, best product killer app, um, of Bitcoin companies is buy, sell Bitcoin, literally getting people onto Bitcoin, getting it in there on their personal balance sheets. Um, but I think we're beginning to see the, and not, a, not only beginning, it's beginning to mature the um, usage of Bitcoin as collateral in traditional structured credit products. And so we're beginning to see Bitcoin bleed into and create bridges to the traditional financial system. Um, and so I think this cycle, one of the big products that we're going to see is come to maturity and begin to proliferate more than it has to date is Bitcoin is super collateral and structured credit products that act as a bridge and a way to de-risk um, uh, credit products that people are comfortable with. So Unchain is a great example. Down the hall, they have their Bitcoin lending desk. You put Bitcoin up as collateral, you get cash back. Um, you have a well collateralized loan. As long as you're paying that back, you're going to get your Bitcoin back at the end of the day. That is beginning to mature. Um, fold going public, they've announced that they would like to offer um, Bitcoin mortgages where you have um, a mortgage, which is a credit product. And within the mortgage, you have your real estate, which is part of the equity of the, uh, within the loan. And then you have Bitcoin that you put in it too. And that acts as a sort of hedging, mm -hmm. um, a hedging strategy within that credit product where um, if the housing if people wake up one day and decide Bitcoin's a far superior sort of value asset than housing and, and a lot of people dump their houses and you own a house with a Bitcoin back mortgage, you're somewhat de risked because even if the underlying value of your house is going down, you have Bitcoin in that loan and that Bitcoin's going up and sort of evens out the the negative effect of the depreciating value of the the real estate. Um so that Timing, I think, is perfect for that, particularly if we're going into a bull market. We've established that Bitcoin is a trillion dollar market. Um, I think that will go up an order of magnitude 10, 20, 30 trillion um, this cycle, potentially, or within the next 10 years. And at that point, that's a pretty stable market. I think we'll go higher than that. But I think we're just yeah. working through the order of operations of how you get to this end state of. Bitcoin being not only the reserve currency of the world, but the day-to-day -day currency that people use to buy their goods and services and um, operate throughout the economy. Would that also be your like um, main indicator to see that we hit like mainstream adoption, or like the 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 point in time and space where where Bitcoin really changes like the economic landscape? Would it be that or something else? I think something like that, because I think what we need is track record, right? Like the, I think that's the next big step for these credit products. Unchained lending desk, they have a seven year track record. I believe over a billion dollars of loans issued, never had a loan loss. And from a credit investor perspective, the fact that they've never had a loan loss is a big deal. It's like, oh, I can take dollars. I'm a credit fund manager. I need to put these dollars in credit funds um, or credit products. And you're telling me that there's a product that exists out there that can get me a relatively high rate of return um, that has never had a loan loss. Like that's unheard of. I mean, we say this often at 1031 is that the lending desk on chain is one of the mis most mispriced credit products in the world because of the relative way they de-risk the product uh, where you have a two or three multi-sig wallet can't be rehypothecated. Re you have a, a low LTV, um, and it's just consistent. If the price of Bitcoin crashes or a borrower cannot pay um, pay pay back their loan, like the ability to move that Bitcoin, liquidate it, and get cash back to the credit investors is yeah. almost instantaneous. Yeah. Um, 
And I think that very simple use case of Bitcoin backed US dollar loans or fiat loans is well established. And now, as we get into more consumer oriented credit products like real estate, car loans, commercial real estate loans, and, and those products develop a track record, particularly if you have a demonetization of real estate uh, alongside these products building a, a track record, it's going to be obvious. People are going to be like, oh my gosh, the people that took out these loans that were dual collateralized with the asset um, that they were, they were acquiring and Bitcoin are performing way better. Mm. Um, and then you'll just have uh, the inflection point of people that are forced to allocate dollars in the credit products, understanding that these products are far superior from a, a risk-adjusted return profile, and then you'll see money flood into them. And the other interesting thing, particularly for like Bitcoin-backed mortgages and commercial real estate deals, is those are long-duration credit products. And so if you hit an inflection point where people wake up and they're like, holy crap, this is a superior way to structure these credit products, you're going to pull a lot of Bitcoin off the market for many years, many cycles. Um, if if four year cycles continue, um, if you're doing real estate, commercial real estate, like at least two cycles, and you pull, you're, could potentially pull a ton of supply off the market, and that I think would actually curb the cyclical nature of Bitcoin price movements historically, because you would take a lot of supply and lock it yeah. in a ten year credit product, a thirty year credit product. Yeah. It just creates a more stable floor of liquidity from which to build on. Yeah, you um. You 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 mentioned uh, in a byline uh, my my paper be, uh, before I am um, I'm, I'm almost publishing it so still for the people listening I'm gonna publish it but there I talk about you know once you understand that Bitcoin is the best reward for you know your time and energy you will only want that right or you will only offer that because you know that once you offer that you will also get better value in return for whoever you're hiring or whatever product you're buying right but I think the same is true for the pristine collateral. You know, if you if you understand that this is the most pristine collateral there is, the, mo the you know the highest value property that you could have, and you put it up as a collateral, it kind of works both ways in this value exchange that that you were talking about. Um, I've also I've walked around in a, in a traditional uh, uh, bank and in like the risk department, and I once uh, did like a round with the chief risk officer, and he said, you know, I can send all these uh, econometrists and the PhDs that are, you know chugging along in their Excel sheets all day, I can send them all home and nothing's going to happen because the first thing people pay is their mortgage, right? Every month, basically. Like that's the first thing they they pay. So even if all these analysts, uh, risk analysts are gone, you know, 90% uh, of people will still pay or over 90% of people will still pay their mortgage, you know, and even if there's like defaults that we didn't see, nothing's really going to happen. But I think because... You know, they th this makes them complacent. I think even o over time, right? And so, Bitcoin gives an opportunity to build new. You know what banks should have been, and when you use Bitcoin as a collateral, there's like an it, it's more of like an equal exchange having to borrow money for your mortgage for, and and putting up the the Bitcoin as the collateral. Like you both know, both parties know how pristine it is, right? So it kind of makes this agreement uh, stronger and it works for the business model of the bank and it works for you know the person that wants um, the mortgage and I think in in that way it's really really of, of of added value and it also will spur a lot of competition I think between providers that that are offering this yeah I mean it'll bring back proper underwriting techniques right and due diligence yeah which is like, exactly yeah again it brings back opportunity costs it's like all right we actually have to do our job now and make sure that we're not giving these loans out to anybody um because if there's a possibility that we could lose the bitcoin like we, we can't stomach yeah. that yeah but this is exactly i think what bitcoin shows is is how it's conceptualized on paper is actually like bitcoin will force you to work how it's conceptualized on paper Right. And so even if there's like opportunities to corrupt it, like people are doing now or did, you know, um, great financial crisis, I think a great example of uh, all this rehypothecation and stuff. It, it just keeps you in check. Once you put Bitcoin in the mix, you keep people in check, basically. And uh, 
yeah i love that yeah and that's we need that's what the world desperately needs right now like the proliferation of easy money over the last five decades however long whatever time period you want to put on it but it's inarguable that it's been happening for uh, a generation at least like has led to so many unnecessary dislocations in the economy and um, poor capital allocation that like you have that's why i think the world is as chaotic as it is right now is because you really don't have any signal in terms of what the market needs because it's corrupted by yeah. these central bank decisions and the issuance of debt by by the governments um they can just print money and throw it at bad things like when you are forced to reckon with the fact that there's no printing bitcoin and mm-hmm. you have to operate within a framework that if you lose that bitcoin you can't print more you can't bail out um you can't bail out bad decisions like you're going to be forced to be sharper and to make better decisions from a capital allocation perspective it's just the way it works like and like you said like once you have that framework like there's you're forced to reckon with it and Mm -hmm. that is like nobody's really forced to reckon with it within the fiat system they say yeah the the bailouts will come they're not going to let this let this fail and that's where you get the i've seen uh, that (laughs) yeah that's where you get the um what's the common term used uh perverse incentives is one but uh i I can't remember the economic term but um you just it ends in poor decision making because uh there's no accountability because there's always that that safety net there exactly yeah and so bitcoin gives you a, a a forced accountability which in the long run will be good for you but i think that ties back to you know why it's an ego challenge or something more spiritual than uh, related to intelligence right like can you handle that right like can you handle the fact that when you hold bitcoin you were forced to adopt a responsibility over the most pristine property thing that you could ever have right and especially in a in like a professional uh, setting I, I i think that would be uh that would be very good and beneficial, right? Uh, yeah, and that that again shows how Bitcoin can be this mirror because you will have Bitcoin banks, you will have Bitcoin denominated investors, and everything like that, right? And they will they will be benchmarked against you know traditional banks, traditional investors, whatever. And um, I think over time we are just going to see that they will outperform. Are, or are more trustworthy or you know however you would quantify or qualify um like these these services or operators yeah yeah and that's the beauty of bitcoin too whether or not you develop the humility and the accountability necessary to operate within a economy run on a bitcoin standard like the market will force it on you eventually like i said like these credit products i think yeah. many people are overlooking them now but as they continue to develop a track record, if you if we look back five uh, in five years, ten years, we look back and look at the performance of these particular credit products. I, I am pretty confident, supremely confident, that it's going to be very obvious to people that it is. And those funds and the individuals who took advantage of those products are going to benefit massively. And that's when, again, with going back to track record, that's when the benchmark begins to materialize and people are are forced to benchmark themselves against this performance and particularly if you're a money manager the people giving you the money to manage you're going to look at it and be like how the hell did you miss this boat and that'll be a forcing function for all right we yeah. got to figure this out yeah how did these randos on the internet figure this out before yeah. you you know i think that's what i think a lot um so if if bitcoin is this tool for personal freedom how if more people adopt it, like how does it impact the balance of power between individuals and the government? Because the same thing, or like what we just talked about, you know, let's say for banks and mortgages, uh, eventually is the same type of change in the, let's call it the incentives game, right? Um, between people and their government. So once you hold Bitcoin and the government wants to tax you, they have to be they have to bring you a really good pitch on uh, why you should part way with your bitcoin and and what they're going to spend it on how how yeah how do you see this develop or what's your look on it um 
And maybe that, that was my next question. But I think there's some game theory in there as well, right? I mean, some companies are, or some uh, countries are going to give the right examples uh, on like how to integrate Bitcoin in policy making, just your general economy, etc. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's two parts to this. One is the literal mechanics of how Bitcoin works. It's a push system. Like you can't just pull Bitcoin from my from my, my wallet. I have to sign a private key and push it to you. Mm-hmm. So your point of like your government is going to need to make a very compelling case for why you should push your Bitcoin to their account so they can go take it and exactly. do what they want to with it um, is is a very important realization or reality to to understand and yes people will say well the government has guns and they'll come and forcibly take it but at scale they can't really do that to everyone i don't think and um the other part is like you mentioned the the competition amongst amongst different uh governments and states is beginning to to bubble up we're seeing with el salvador i mean argentina hasn't really put forth a um explicit bitcoin strategy but i think their overarching strategy of smaller government enable the free market is playing out well for them. And then you, you have the um, Western democracies really fumbling the ball in terms of their ability to ensure that people can remain free and that net markets can remain relatively stable. So I think um, the government, particularly the Western governments, um, that are mismanaging their economies and their social and political systems are losing leverage. Yes, they have weapons, but uh, again, I think time and history has proven that people, uh, the long arch of, of history bends towards freedom and innovation. And I think um, regardless of how much the governments don't want this to happen, it's going to happen because people are just going to get fed up and the accessibility and the ability to access Bitcoin is so trivial that it will be very hard for them to stop it. We've already seen this play out with the internet mm-hmm. over the last 30 years. Um, so yeah, I think the the interaction between the individual and their government will change drastically. It'll take time. There's a lot of dead skin that needs to be shed before people really recalibrate what it means to be an individual interacting with the government and what that relationship looks like. But I think naturally over time, the market just force smaller governments on the world um, or the market will force governments to be, be smaller. And that's a good thing. That's part of the reason um, I'm excited about today is because I, again, going back to what I said in the beginning of this conversation, like I think we have two stark paths. One, which is a continuation of incumbent administrations, objectively socialist woke policies and um, inefficient allocation of capital and um, issuance of debt. And who knows? Uh, the other path, what's being promised, is uh, a recognition, like an administration that's going to recognize that there are systemic problems with the sovereign debt and the economy. And the fact that the government, the federal government in the United States has become too bloated, too large, and too inefficient, and we'll we'll have to hold these people accountable to the promises they've made. But what they're promising is we recognize that the government is bloated, inefficient, and is leading to really bad outcomes for the citizens of America. And we're going to promise to make it smaller, make it more efficient, and unleash the ability for Americans to go out and innovate, whether that be in Bitcoin, energy defense, um, space technology, um, AI. And I, I think that that is um, a validation of the fact that like, people are fed up and are seeing what's happening in El Salvador and Argentina and other places with, with smaller governments and better tax structures and saying that no, we want something different. And we're approaching 3 p.m. here in central time zone in the United States. We'll see how the votes get tallied and who ultimately wins. But I think um, this election particularly is really driving home that juxtaposition. And even if we do go down the route of (laughs) getting a Kamala Harris presidency, um, 
that that continues uh, with um, very irresponsible spending and more socialist policies. Like, I think Bitcoin is going to to shine. It may not shine in the short to medium term, but I think ultimately people recognize that this is not the way in which the world should work or the path we should go down. They will accumulate and hold Bitcoin and try to keep it away from the government, falling back to the fact that it's a push system and they can't pull it for you from you. Yeah. So they'll accumulate Bitcoin and make sure that the government has no way to pull it from them. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I was thinking, yeah. So even if, if, if there's a Harris win, you know, you cannot deny that there is uh, like, I personally think there's like a very thin line or there, there, there's a very subtle start to like a global game theory kicking off basically i mean there's i think there's more than than five uh, countries now that are mining bitcoin for example with government resources right uh, el salvador bhutan uh, ethiopia um i read something about argentina uae you know like we are already here <laughs> you know there's already states or countries mining bitcoin and you know you are not bullish like what what you know like countries are doing this they are not of course as serious or as big as as the us but i mean every country uses the same fiat money system right so uh, and 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 uh, the us dollar is the the best of the worst in that sense so even if it's not in the us there's going to be other countries that are going to pay let's say more attention um probably they won't talk about it until it's strategically smart. I would say it is strategically smart to talk about it, right? Like I'm mining Bitcoin that, you know, would, would kick it off. And if you have your stack already, you know, um, you will do really well uh, as a country. But yeah, what what are your ideas on this? Do you have uh, any anything to uh, speculate about? No, it's only going to increase from here. The only winning move is to play the game and some governments are yeah have have realized this earlier than others and i mean Bhutan's a perfect example like if you look at that small country in the himalayas i, I ran the numbers a few months ago they have more than thirteen thousand bitcoin they have seven million sats per per capita which is insane wow um, really generational wealth for uh bhutanese people uh, at some point down the line, if we hit a hundred, two hundred, three hundred trillion dollar market cap, like literally give everybody a, a wow. lifelong pension, potentially. Um, and at, we don't even need to get to a hundred million uh, plus market cap for the benefits of Bhutan being an early mover to to materialize. I think if we mm-hmm. we go up significantly from where we are now, we have another two, three, five x. I think the um, the power that that thirteen thousand plus Bitcoin treasury is going to afford Bhutan is going to be very evident, and they're going to be very happy yeah. if they did that. And then they'll go out and either use that treasury to reinvest in their country or um, make things better for for their citizens. Uh, and other countries, particularly other citizens of other countries, will look at that and say, "Look, why don't we have that?" And yeah. it's just going to continue. I mean, it is the game theory. The only winning move, yeah, is to and play. in that way, it's again the mirror, right? Yeah, that you see another country thrive when they adopt Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's funny, like here in America, uh, even though we've had very chaotic policy as it pertains to Bitcoin, like we've had Operation Choke Point Two Point Zero targeting the banks, but despite all that, it's crazy how um, the American spirit. Uh, really just brute forces through everything. Like Americans, ha- I believe, have the most Bitcoin per capita in terms of individual ownership of Bitcoin. The industry is thriving here, and it is in spite of a, a government that has done everything they can or done a lot of things to prevent that success from happening. And um, as the price of Bitcoin goes up, that's the other, I think this election is the first election where this is really shining through the de Meester talks about this a lot but as the price of bitcoin goes up and individual the the wealth of individual bitcoiners increases like they get to play the political game in terms of 
backing politicians and putting people um, in positions to write favorable laws. And that's another part of the game theory is as the price goes up, um, money talks <laughs> and mm-hmm. whether people want to recognize it or not, it's just a fact. And I think we're seeing that with this election. I think Bitcoin slash crypto super PACs um, collectively were the second biggest driver of, of donations for the Trump campaign yeah. this cycle. Um, and again, promises. We'll have to hold them accountable, but it seems like because of that support, there is going to be a more favorable regulatory environment for individuals and companies building in the space. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I'm. Uh, I wonder if we're going to see a price reaction if, uh, if Trump wins. I would expect so. I mean, it's already happened. We're going back towards seventy right now. Already, yeah. I'm looking rolling. at the clock behind you. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, man. My 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 last. I have I have three last questions. How has adopting Bitcoin changed your life philosophy? Um, it, it certainly. I mean, philosophy. Uh, it has certainly helped me lower my time preference, but I think it really helped me kickstart my my family earlier than otherwise would have been possible. Like I was fortunate enough to find Bitcoin in college and save up the money from save up some money from working at restaurants and working at the fund to to allocate um and save that Bitcoin over time. And I hit a rough patch uh in my mid twenties where I was sort of at this crossroads of what I wanted to do for a career and was not happy with the job I had and wanted to jump ship and um, decided to quit. And it took much longer for me to find a job uh, than I expected. But luckily I had that Bitcoin savings that I could rely on. Um, so it gave me some stability and comfortability and eventually started the newsletter, started TFTC, found a job in the Bitcoin mining space and got back on my feet. But Bitcoin acted as that temporary lifeboat for me, I got married in that period, started having kids in my late twenties, which is a bit of uh, an anomaly these days for for many people, um, particularly in the United States. And I don't think I would have been able to number one have the confidence to quit that job, uh, <laughs> be able to survive uh, an extended bout of unemployment, um, be able to start my business, my family without Bitcoin. So, like, I mean, I think. A lesson learned throughout that period in my mid to late twenties was it's important to lower your time preference and save. I'm very happy that twenty one year old Marty um had the presence of mind to to save in Bitcoin. Awesome. I I mean I think this is the prime example of uh or, or story that I think is inspiring to, you know, the the audience that I'm trying to reach, you know, our our generation. I think a lot of people um wait before getting married or wait before living together with you know their um their partner or wait before they start having children or they're really insecure about the the future right and uh i think what you share is a prime example of how good money can give you time and space towards the future to figure out what's next right like that's the entire point of saving money is that you basically save time to give yourself the time when you when you actually need it and so i think uh i think it's awesome that you share that and and that that is a i think still very true for people that put it up bitcoin now right like it is a tool for you to lower the uncertainty towards your future so you can figure out what your what your path may be whatever it is right like it's uh, not about what you do but the fact that you can give yourself the the time and space to actually figure that out yeah you don't realize it till you need it either. Like I didn't right. yeah, expect exactly. the uh, the Bitcoin I was saving when I was twenty one to um, give me the space and time to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. When yeah, of course, it was unexpectedly. Well, you did, yeah, you did better than me. Like I, I bought at the same time. I think uh, I was, uh, I think two two years. I was twenty six, and uh, I, I, yeah, I bought at three four hundred. I sold everything at four thousand, and then uh, you know, over time, got back in. At that time, it was a great. But of course, looking back, like I have less Bitcoin now than I had back then, you know, but, uh, but we're back I mean, on the horse. I do. It's too. all part of the journey. Yeah, yeah. of course. 
Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you, uh, I'm really excited for this question, actually. You know, you've you've been diving into this for 10 years and I wanted to ask you, what is like a spiky point of view you have on Bitcoin that not a lot of people share with you? Uh, I, th I mean... I think you may share this with me, but I, I think it's I think it's going to happen way faster than people realize. I think we're at that. Like I think and people talk about the concept of hyper Bitcoinization. Um, I think we're living through it right now, and I would not be surprised if we look back or we we wake up in twenty thirty and it's like, oh shit, we're we're using Bitcoin as our reserve currency, and people are accepting and spending Bitcoin all over the place. Um, I think many people have a multi decade. They're like, oh maybe. Um, in the t mid 2030s, 2040s, we'll get to that point. I think it ha could happen much quicker. And it's not really a sticky view. I think many people would be happy and elated if, if that were actually the case. But that, and I don't think mining pool centralization is as big of a problem as many people are making it out to be right now. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly not ideal, but I don't think it's a existential risk to Bitcoin survival. Yeah, I would agree. I, it's funny you say fast is, you know, in the next six, seven years. Um, once I heard that, you know, in 2033, 99% of all Bitcoin have been mined in the last percent, you know, in the 107 years after, which is a rounding error. You know, once you realize that combined with, well, a bit of the doom and gloom we talked about before, you know, what, what will the U.S. debt be in 2033? Who knows? There are some projections. Um, yeah, there, there again, inflection point. I don't know it's my 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 term of the week, I think. But yeah, once people realize that, you know, they're gonna move. They have to move, right? And it's gonna be a Bitcoin rush until twenty thirty three, until the ninety nine percent. Because afterwards, then, like, you really have to work for it, you know. So yeah. the. Um, yeah, un un until we hit the 99%, it's still fairly attainable, I would say. And yeah, yeah once you see that, you have to move, right? You have to you have to go. Yeah, and even after that point, it is attainable. Like, if you have uh, marketable skills and the ability to provide the market with something that's demanded, you can make, you can stack Bitcoin. It's going to be much harder, but um, things are going to be better for everybody. I think the quality... Again, bring back that opportunity cost, quality of goods and services, the quality of life uh, and the economy overall are going to increase significantly. And that's good for everybody, not only yeah. early Bitcoin adopters. I agree. All right. Last question. And uh, I ask everyone the same question, which is what is a core belief that you will never let go? Most people are good people. Um, and I think that's important for people to recognize particularly at this point in time where it seemed i mean the day of the u.s election the country's at its throats you have family um fighting you have blood fighting blood and there's very vitriolic rhetoric on both sides um and i do think most people on both sides are good people um and really if push came to shove would recognize that they should choose their their fellow citizen their fellow brother cousin whatever it may be mm. over the government um i do think people 99 percent of people are good people just want to be able to live uh a life that w of dignity have a family hang out with their friends eat good food listen to good music and um make the world a better place um that's something i'll never give up on is the human spirit and most people being good awesome man well thanks for sharing and thanks so much for this conversation i really enjoyed it and uh yeah man we'll stay in touch thank you bram it was a pleasure likewise cheers thanks for watching if you enjoyed this episode you can click here to find more just like it and you can click here to find all bitcoin for millennials podcast episodes also please like the video if you want to help shine a light on the message of bitcoin and subscribe to get notified when I publish new episodes of the podcast or new videos on this channel. I want to thank you again for watching. I appreciate your support and I'll catch you in the next episode. Bye.